Guys, I thought we were never changing our clocks back again. Did you think that? They said that we were never going to have to do this again. They said it was never going to get dark at 4.30 in the afternoon again, but they lied to us. You know, there's not many things you vote for in California that actually pass. The, the adults know what I'm talking about. That was one of those things that we had bipartisan agreement. There is no need for it to get dark at 5 p.m., okay? And we passed it. Californians had some common sense. It was like the only thing they voted for that year that made any sense. But we voted to say no more daylight savings time. I don't know if you know. And if, if you would have asked me a week ago, hey, are we doing the daylight savings time thing? I would have told you last week, no, we're not. We're done with that. We're not changing our clocks anymore because that's what I was told. I read an article one time that told me that and said, no, California passed the law. It's not happening again. And yesterday on the patio, someone was talking about changing the clocks. And I'm like, no, no, no. I came in, you know, acting like I knew, right? No, no, no. We don't do that anymore. Don't you know the law thing passed and they had a bill about it and we're not doing daylight savings time again. And some person in another conversation overheard me and said, no, 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 we are. And I was like, okay, I don't want to get in a fight on the patio. I'm a pastor, right? This sounds like a bad idea. But like, I don't think we are. And then everyone started being like, no, I think we are. No, I think, and I was like outgunned. I was like the only one still saying that. And then they showed me on the phone, no, look, we are. And all of a sudden I, uh, my defensiveness kind of went away. I just kind of felt really bad. I'm like, oh, yeah. You ever go out on a limb on something and, like, you thought you knew, and then you get proved wrong, and it's kind of awkward, and like, oh, yeah, that's, that's annoying. But even before that, like, we always kind of feel defensive, right? If you go and say something, and everyone contradicts you, there's a defensiveness that we all feel. Now, some of you feel that to a heightened degree. Perhaps you're a stubborn person. Perhaps you are really, like, kind of a fighter, and it's like, no, I'm right. Some of you feel that way. Others of you might be a little bit more chill, but all of us get this sense of like defensiveness when we're insulted, when we're contradicted, when we're hurt, especially if it's something really bad. Like if someone stabs us in the back, right? Not physically, but you know, relationally. Maybe if you got stabbed in the back, you'd have an emotional reaction too. But I'm talking about relationally. Even if that happens, you, you know something about yourself, right? You know that you get defensive about that. I want to ask you a question. Why do we get so defensive when we're insulted, when we're hurt, when we're contradicted? Why do we get so defensive? I think there's a reality that's true about you and it's true about me, and it's that the reason we get so defensive when we're hurt or insulted is because we are selfish. We are self-centered, right? Because take it back to that dumb thing that happened yesterday, right, where I got contradicted and I was wrong. It's like, why would it matter? Why should I get defensive about it? It's like, I don't know everything. Maybe that person knows something that I don't know. What would make me get defensive? It's self-centeredness in me that would make me defensive. And if you were to take that into your relationships too, if someone wrongs you or insults you and you feel defensive, do you know why you feel defensive? You feel defensive because you're thinking about yourself. There's a level of self-centeredness that is true about all our de defensive mechanisms that we put up against people, especially when we feel like we're wronged or insulted or something like that. Well, Jesus addresses that in the Sermon on the Mount. He addresses the kind of defensiveness that we feel when we're wronged. And he says, look, there's a natural reaction when we're hurt to be like, I want to I wanna punch back. I want to fight back. I want to insult back. Someone says something bad about me. My natural self-centered reaction is, well, but what about them? You know, that's what we do, and that's self-centered. And I want you to see this from what Jesus has to say, because people were taking an Old Testament law, and they were twisting it to try to say, hey, God says we can take revenge when we're hurt. God says that if someone uh, knocks out our eye, we can knock them right back out and knock out their eye. You might know this as the eye for an eye passage. Just open up to Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at this together. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 38, Jesus addresses these Old Testament commands. And remember, he said stuff like, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you, he's going to do that multiple times. And what he says this time is he quotes the Old Testament. And, you know, every time he quotes the Old Testament, because we read what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, he said, I did not come to abolish the Old Testament law. I didn't come to say, nope, God was wrong. 
we've moved on. I did not come to do that. I came to fulfill the Old Testament law. So there might be some changes in the way that we interact with the Old Testament, but it's still important and it's still valuable. I say that because this command is a little bit different than the commands that he quoted earlier. Remember he quoted, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, even if you look with lust, you're committing adultery in your heart. So he's taking a law that they think they're keeping, and he's saying, no, you're not really keeping it at a heart level. That's similar to what Jesus is going to do here. But the law that he quotes was a misapplied law that they were using incorrectly. And we're going to talk about how to correctly use this law in a minute. But let's look at it together. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Jesus said, you heard that it was said to people in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What does that mean? There's an Old Testament law that said, if someone knocks your tooth out today, out of anger, or they do it even on accident, he says, someone knocks out your tooth, what does justice require of them? That they get their tooth knocked out, right? which might make all the little, you know, boys and girls at church a little bit more careful if they got the same, you know, injury that they gave to somebody else, right? But that was the Old Testament law, and it was a civil law, right? And it wasn't something that these people were supposed to take into their own hands. Even the texts that talk about this talk about, you know, presenting the case to the judge. And if there's witnesses, there has to be more than one witness. So there's all these, like, legal rules about all this, but that was a good Old Testament law. It's a fair law. Jesus is not coming along and saying, yeah, that was what it was back then, but that's really not fair, God changed his mind. That's not fair now. We're going to do something different. He's not saying that. But he's saying the way this was used by the rabbis, just like the whole oath thing was used incorrectly before, it was being used by the rabbis to say, don't you know the Old Testament says an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? That means if someone insults you, you're allowed to insult them back. If somebody punches you, you can punch them back. If if somebody drags your name through the mud, and they gossip about you, you know what the Bible says you can do? You can just do it right back. That's what the rabbis were saying. And Jesus shows, no, 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 that's a misinterpreted law. It's it's true in a civil case, like if someone stole your car, according to the law, yeah, you can go get that car back, and they might have to pay you back, and if they crash the car, they have to pay for the damages. That's what an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was meant for. It was not meant for you and your brother or your sister with an insulting match. That's not what it's for. But the rabbis misinterpreted it, and Jesus has to say, no, 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 you got it all wrong. Verse 39, he says, but I say to you, disciples, in your relationships with each other, do not resist the one who's evil. So there might be a person in your life who's doing wrong to you. In this text, very interesting, very counterintuitive, what does it say? Do not resist the one who's evil. I could point a lot of Bible verses that say we are supposed to resist the evil one. Like 1 Peter 5 says we're supposed to resist him firm in our faith, right? So what are we talking about here? We're not talking about, you know, don't fight against Satan and, and don't stand up for justice in the world. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying in your interpersonal relationships where this law was being abused, he says, no, no, no. You got someone in your life who's insulting you? Don't insult them back. You got someone in your life, like even if it's, you know, a parent or a sibling or a, a co-worker at work or even if it's a classmate at school and they're being nasty to you, guess what that does not give you the right to do? It does not give you the right to do it back. Don't resist the one who's evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. These are famous words of Jesus that, again, have been very misinterpreted. It's ironic that this passage is one where Jesus is helping correct a misinterpretation and people in our world have taken this correction and misinterpret even what Jesus is saying here, right? Because, uh, you know, I would bring up a person for an example, but I don't want to do that because I don't want you to get the visual of me slapping anybody. But I want you to take your hands and I want you to feel your face, okay? Just real quick, feel your face. Which side is the right side, right? Just touch the right side of your face, okay? So if you were facing a right-handed person, what side would you get hit on with an open-handed slap? The left side. Oh, well, what is this about, right? Okay, get this. It's not like that, no. If someone slapped you on the right cheek, how did they slap you? Backhanded slap, okay? 
So even when I say that's a backhanded slap, that's a little bit more insulting. I mean, front-handed slap's not much better, right? But a backhanded slap here, this is an insult, okay? Imagine now, you didn't live in America. Imagine you lived in like an honor-shame culture where like whatever happens to you in public like stays with you. Oh, this is a big deal. What is he talking about? He's talking about something that is highly insulting. He says, okay, if someone was to backhanded slap you as a sign of your disgrace, what are you supposed to do, right? Turn the other also. What does that mean, right? That means, oh, you, you could slap me on the other side of my face too. That's what he's trying to say. But it's an insult here. Okay, so again, what I'm not saying is, hey, those of you who do jujitsu and taekwondo, here's what you do next time. Someone hits you, you just say, okay, hit the other one too, right? This has a context, right? We don't want to misunderstand this. Jesus is talking about in your interpersonal relationships, just like with oaths, where he says, don't swear an oath. You don't need to swear an oath. Just say yes or no. In your interpersonal relationships, as a disciple, if someone insults you, don't insult them back. That's what he's saying. This is an insulting thing. It's not life-threatening, right? And it wasn't back then either. If someone, you know, backhanded slapped you, that's not a life-threatening thing. It's more about your honor than it is about your face. Because your face will heal up real quick. Your honor, especially in that culture, wouldn't so fast. So he's saying, okay, you're insulted. You can let them insult you. If someone says something nasty about you and it's not true, you can let them say that. Right? Not that it's good, not that you want them to but you can allow them to. Don't fight back immediately. He says in verse 40, if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now we're talking about fashion, different kind of ancient fashion. There are two important things, a tunic and a cloak. The tunic was like a shirt. Cloak was like a big jacket, right? And again, they didn't have a ton of clothes back then. So the tunic was what you wore underneath. He says, if someone would sue you for your tunic, okay, and again, a hyper-literalistic interpretation of this in every situation leads to nakedness, okay? Do you understand how that works, right? If someone takes your tunic and your cloak, right, you are naked, okay? So what does Jesus mean by this? Okay, this is, this is a hard passage to interpret. What he's saying is, okay, if someone's going to sue you for your cloak, which in the ancient law, you were not allowed to sue someone for their, for their cloak, their outerwear, you were allowed to sue them for their you know, their shirt, which is just so dumb, but, um, you know, this is weird, but you were not allowed to sue for a cloak. That's because in the Old Testament, in Exodus 22, God said, you can't sue someone for their cloak because that's their blanket at night. That's their covering. Don't sue someone for that. It's not even allowed. So God put a limit on what they're allowed to sue each other for. But the Jews, instead of being like, oh, if God doesn't want us to steal clothes, um, instead of saying, well, we probably shouldn't allow people to sue for any of your clothes, they said, oh, well, maybe, you, you know, they can steal your underwear, but not your shirt, right? It's like, this is kind of ridiculous, right? This is pretty dumb. But this is the common misinterpretations of the rabbis. So anyway, he goes on. He says, if someone steals or sues you for that, let them have the other thing as well. You see how this is very similar to the whole backhanded slap? This is trying to say, and we already talked about suing and, and going to court. Remember in Matthew 5, he says, if someone takes you to court, you should settle with them before you get there, right? Before it's all exposed and before it's all, all a bunch of drama, you should settle it before. Same idea. If someone thinks that you did wrong to them, you should go over the top to show them that you have goodwill, right? If someone says, oh, like you're this and you're that, and they start accusing you and there's some kind of dialogue and some kind of fighting, you should go the extra mile to say, you know what? I'm gonna show you. You're, you're wrong about me being mean or hateful towards you. I'll, I'll grant you even more, right? You, you think that I stole something from you? you th- and then you want to take my shirt? Dude, take my jacket too. You can have both. Why? To show I'm not against you. I'm with you. That was what this would show to these people. It's very interesting. Take some thinking though. Next verse. What does he say next? Verse 41. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now that's weird right? Forced walks, right? This is not a romantic walk. This is not, you know, boyfriends, if your girlfriend makes you walk Dana Point Harbor, right, walk all PCH, right? This is not what he's saying, okay? What he's saying, there was this, this thing that they did back in the Roman Empire. They had all these uh, soldiers, right? And they had all these equipment, right? And guess what they would do? They'd say, hey, equipment's kind of heavy, got a bunch of subjugated people. You know what? Carry my stuff. Right? This is like bully in 1950s, like, give me your lunch money movie vibes, right? This is similar, but this is what they did. 
And here's what Jesus says. Okay, a Roman soldier comes up to you and says, carry my pack for one mile, which was the law, according to the Romans. You couldn't make someone carry your pack for more than a mile. That was against their law. But Jesus says, carry it for two miles. What is he trying to say? Someone's trying to attack you. Someone's trying to uh, go against you. Someone's trying to even exploit you for free labor, which is what he's talking about here. Uh, go over the top. Say, oh, I won't just, you know, clean, you know, the, the garage. I'll clean the inside of the trash cans. Not to get too personal. But that, think about what he's saying. Go the extra mile, literally the extra mile, one mile to two miles. But he's talking about service. When it comes to service, if someone's even forcing you to serve, go above and beyond in your interpersonal relationships. Verse 42, he goes even further. Now he's not just talking about if someone makes you do something. Now he's saying, what if someone asks you to do something? He says in verse 42, give to the one who begs from you. The beggars back then were a lot different than the beggars now, right? Beggars now pull in about six figures, about $100,000. If you want a job to make $100,000, you can go beg outside of Costco. You can go beg outside one of these places. They pull in a massive amount of money. Uh, that's not the begging that he's talking about here. The begging he's talking about here is the people who were crippled and who were lame and could not work. And in that society, there was no safety net. Uh, uh, you know, if you work anywhere, you pay all these taxes. You're like, why did all these, these dollars and cents go out of my account? Like, have you, be, have you become conservative yet as you've started working? Or you're like, where, where'd all the money go, right? Like, you know where that went to? It went to the government. You know what the government does with it? Gives a lot of money and programs to help people who can't afford a lot of things. So our culture has this big safety net. Some would argue it's too big, but that's not the conversation we're having right now, okay? Point is, it's a big safety net. They did not have that back then. What they had was, you knew, you know, you knew, you knew Timmy who would beg for, for bread and you'd give him some because he doesn't have anything. He doesn't have a family. He doesn't have a home and he's in your community and it's like, I need to help that guy out. I need to give that guy a ride, so to speak. It's similar, you know, those of you who are impoverished because you don't have cars yet. It's like, get, give to your friend because they need a ride, right? Don't, don't refuse. Don't be like, ah, I don't know, I don't know. Well, you you got to pay me $5 for gas. I did the, no, stop it, right? Just, just be generous, right? That was, that was a lot of things. It's a lot of things because Jesus gives four examples. He starts with, hey, don't resist the evil one. And then he goes all the way to start to tell you, not only should you not be a revengeful, retaliatory person, you should change as a disciple to where at the end, you're not just not going to take revenge, but you're going to be generous and forgiving. Like there's a transformation that should take place for disciples. And that's what Jesus is getting at. He's basically saying, look, if you could ditch the self-centeredness in your life, you'd start by not retaliating. And then you'd start to pity the people that sin against you. Then you'd start to forgive them. Then you'd start to even want to give out of the goodness of your heart that God has worked in you so that now you're a giving person. That's a transformation that's supposed to take place. That's what Jesus is getting at. Now, this is an often misinterpreted passage. But I want to start by even going to that first verse again. What is this law all about? The eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Because we cover a lot of ground here. The first point, love for you to write it down. Point number one, I want you to learn God's purpose for his civil justice laws. Okay, That might sound like we're taking AP Gov right now, but um, no. His civil justice laws. What is this all about? Well, in the Old Testament, you know that there's not just one type of law. There's a lot of types of laws. Now, all the laws that God gives, as we studied just early, we heard Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. So God's word is this like good, perfect standard. And if you ever start reading the book of like Exodus or Leviticus, you start to get confused because these laws are not all the same. There's laws about like, you know, can you marry your sister? <laughs> no. And laws about like, where should you cut the grain on your field? These are different kind of laws. And there's also laws about, okay, if you kill an animal, what, if you kill someone else's animal, what do you have to do? Right? The, the Old Testament has all these different laws for the nation of Israel. And one of the most important kinds of laws that you have are these civil justice laws. And here's the point. They are quoting a civil justice law, and they are making it a personal relationship law. It was not meant to be a personal relationship law. It was meant to be a civil law. It's very important. 
to understand that. I want us to look at a passage that, that says this in the book of Leviticus. Turn to the left in your Bibles. Look at Leviticus chapter 24. You do not think you're going to turn to Leviticus 24 this morning, but you're going to see this in God's perfect law. That's at the beginning of the Bible, third book of the Bible, the book of Leviticus. It's God's laws to the Levites. I want us to look at this great passage. Leviticus 24, we'll start in verse 17. If you get there, or if you're there on your phone, you might see there's a heading above it that says, an eye for an eye. So this is what Jesus is quoting that, remember, the rabbis misinterpreted. So let's read what it really meant. An eye for an eye. Verse 17. This is Leviticus 24, 17. God's word says, Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. All right, so a murderer. What is God's rules for murderers in the civil law of the Old Testament? Death. Verse 18. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good life for life. All right, so what does that mean? If you were to go and steal one of your neighbor's oxen or, you know, cows or whatever, what would you have to do? What would you have to do to make it right to that, that owner? Right? You went and took their, their ox and you killed their ox because you really needed it for some sacrifice or something that you're going to do. God says, okay, you should make it good life for life. So human life for cow life? No. Cow life for cow life. You got to give one of your cows up and give it to that person. You see how God is like giving rules for what's fair here? If you get something stolen, you should have it replaced. That's justice. Not that the person goes to jail for 20 years, right? That doesn't help you at all. You know what helps you is to get the money back, right? And that's what he's saying here, okay? Verse 19. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done it, it shall be done to him, okay? You get in some kind of fight. There's some kind of disagreement. Someone starts throwing hands, right? And a tooth comes out. What should we do? Well, verse 20 says, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Interesting, right? There's a lot of purposes to this. The first point was learn God's purpose for his civil law. There's a lot of purposes we learn from this text. Verse 21 says, whoever kills an animal shall make it good. And whoever kills a person shall be put to death. Verse 22, you shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. But you can imagine back in those times, right? You're going to treat one kind of people in the land differently than a privileged type of people. He says, the rule is the same. I don't care if it's a sojourner. I don't care what they look like. Even if a native kills a sojourner who doesn't live there, Life for life. Still the same rules. Injuries, fracture for fracture. And you might think, okay, it it makes sense, but is that really the right way to go about things? Some of you might be like, I don't know about that. I want to just give you some purposes. You can write down some of these purposes. The first purpose that, that God had in this was to give the administration of justice to a third party. Okay, this is very interesting. He's not saying that if someone punches me in the face, all right, you know, Get ready, I'm going to give you a shiner. That's not what he's saying. This context was for the judges and for the rulers in Israel. We see that more clearly in the book of Deuteronomy in particular. In Deuteronomy 19, God says the same kind of thing about life for life, tooth for tooth, eye for eye, foot for foot, all this stuff, right? And he says in that text, this is Deuteronomy 19, the judges shall inquire diligently. That's how this is all set up. So this is not vigilante justice. This is going through a third party, which isn't this interesting that the point of this law was to take justice out of your hands and put it in someone else's hands. And the rabbis are using this text to say, no, justice can go back in your hands. It's the entire purpose of the law broken. It's like the opposite of the point. The other thing, second purpose is it was meant to discourage crime from happening again. Like, this would discourage crime, right? There there wouldn't be so many brawls. There wouldn't be so many thefts if you had to have all that stolen from you. And if you have nothing to steal, then I guess you have to work for it and earn the money, right? Um, In California, have you seen those videos of people, like, going into really nice stores and stealing a bunch of, of, like, expensive stuff? Right, this is super popular. They're having to shut down 
places in San Francisco for this and L.A. for this. Uh, part of the problem and part of the reason why that's happening is because there's no real punishment for theft. What happens? I mean, it, like three or four years ago, there was. Now there's not. What happens immediately once you take away the threat of punishment for stealing? It encourages everyone to steal. So if this punishment was in place, then there'd be less people wanting to steal stuff. Because if what you had to do is get caught and had to pay it all back and then some, it, it's not as appealing to steal things, right? Like, why would I steal something if I have to pay back more? That doesn't really make much sense. It's meant to discourage crime from happening. In fact, in the Deuteronomy 19 passage, it says, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So this scene is about, imagine somebody would accuse another person of a crime and say, they broke my arm, right? Or they broke my left arm. And then once the judges were to look into it, if in fact he was lying, if I falsely accuse you of something, what God's word said was, for me, what would have to take place is they shall do to him what he meant to do to his brother. So if I went and accused you of breaking my left arm and you didn't, God's word would say, okay, well then I'm going to have to have my right arm broken too, right? So and not that person because that person was innocent. So God's law was meant to discourage crime, and that text says, so you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never commit any such evil among you. Okay? So, interesting. It's meant to discourage crime. Third thing it's meant to do is to encourage the punishment of a crime and to not let you have pity on some kind of privileged class of people. The rich people weren't allowed to get away with it, in this system. You might say, where? No, 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 no about that. Next verse in Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy 19.21. God's word says, your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Why? Could you imagine maybe some ancient old system where you've got, I don't know, the daughter or the son of a really wealthy person who goes and makes some trouble and hurts somebody? You could imagine that because of their connections and because of their wealth, they're like, well, we're not going to punish him because they're rich, they're powerful. God's law was meant to cut through all the classes and say, no, 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 like you're going to get punished the same way and your eyes shall not pity. It doesn't matter if it was a freshman girl or a senior guy. Like, look at that. I mean, imagine, this is kind of hard to imagine, but, but imagine, you know, there's a freshman girl and a senior guy and, you know, someone got hurt. Who do I think did the wrong? The guy, right? I'm sorry, guys. But the senior guy, like, you're clearly more capable. This girl probably did not start. Like, that's my natural tendency, right? But if we were to investigate and look and find that, no, it was the girl's fault, the text says, you shall not have pity. Justice needs to take place. And you're not supposed to let your assumption of that person's, how they look like, what family they come from, what, how much money they have, that's not supposed to come into contact with the justice system. No pity. The fourth thing that it was meant to do, I mean, you could imagine that situation again. Freshman girl, senior guy, someone got hurt. Right? What happens next? Well, the fourth purpose was it was meant to prevent excessive and unjust responses of judgment. Here's what I mean by that. You ever seen the movie or the book or the play, Les Miserables? I don't know how you say it. How you say it? Yeah. I just know Jean Valjean, right? You know, that was one of, I, mean, I shouldn't say that. It wasn't my nickname in high school, but there was a group of people that always called me Jean Valjean while we were reading Les Mis in school. Oh, it's Jean Valjean. What are you doing over there? Jean Valjean. I'm like, oh, stop. Uh, I don't even like the movie. I don't even care, but I'm using an example. Okay. Jean Valjean, do you remember him? Do you remember what had to happen to him? Where do you find him at the beginning of the show in the movie? Where is he? He is in a like slave camp, like a quarry, right? What is he doing there? He's in jail. He's serving time. How much time did he serve after all was said and done? Like 19 years. Do you remember what he did? He stole a loaf of bread. Is that just? Is that fair? No. Do you see that? An eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, would not allow him to go to jail for 19 years. Okay? If he was going to go to jail for any amount of time, it would be to work off the amount that was stolen, and that's it, and he'd be free. And how long would that take? Like a month? A week? I don't know, back then. Not 19 years. Okay? So the eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, was also meant to protect the, the victim, or not the victim, the perpetrator. It was meant to protect the perpetrator from some kind of outlandish 
vigilante violence. Okay, maybe here's a more real example. You could imagine in one of these villages where you've got uh, maybe, let's say, a freshman girl who gets her arm broken by a senior guy because he's being careless, right? He's driving the ox, and he doesn't see her, and boom, now she, like, breaks her arm or her leg, okay? What does justice require that his arm or leg is broken? It does not require that girl's angry father to go say, I'm going to go kill that guy because I want to kill him. He hurt my daughter. I'm going to go. I'm going to murder that guy. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth says, nope, dad, you're wrong, can't do that. But that guy, justice needs to be taking place, but it's not some kind of like over-the-top unjust response. Because there there's a way to unjustly respond to crime, to overpunish, to not have the crime match the punishment. There is a way to do that wrong, and this law was meant to prevent that. Um, and if you're like, well, what relation does this have to my life? Well, just want you to know that according to Romans 13, your legal magistrates or the people who are in charge of your society that can send you to jail or can do whatever the justice system requires, they have the right to do that to you if you break their good rules. Right? They have good rules, which Romans 13 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So, what does that mean for us? That means for even as a Christian, even in a non-Israelite context, if you go break the law this weekend, you should be charged for the crime. No pity. No, I should pity you. Your parents shouldn't pity you. The, the justice system should not pity you. If you break the, the rules that are good rules, then you should be punished. Now, the text does say, that a ruler is no terror to, to doing good. There are times in which the rulers become a terror to those who are doing good, right? If it becomes illegal to be a Christian or it becomes illegal to go to church, right? That's when you don't obey, right? That's when we say, well, we can't do that. We, we, gotta, we gotta obey God rather than man. But if the rules are good and they're trying to punish wrongdoers, you and I are subject to those laws. It even says, they do not bear the sword in vain. That means the government can kill you with God's permission if you break the rules to such an extent that the government says you're going to be put to death. That's extreme, right? But that's what God's word says, and it's right. So God has purposes for his civil justice laws. Now, the rabbis misinterpreted this and said, oh, yeah, this is why you can take revenge. I'm going to tell you it's not why you can take revenge because the book of Leviticus literally says you cannot take revenge on people on your own. So the same book that says, right, if you're in Leviticus 24, just turn to the left really fast. Turn to the left to Leviticus 19. Look at what he says here. God's Word has a lot to say about this, and this is why you got to read the, the whole thing to kind of understand it a little bit better. Hard when we're just looking at individual verses, but it, well, you can start in verse 17. Leviticus 19, verse 17. God's Word says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him, right? Like if you hate people, just know that you're probably gonna do wrong in the way you interact with them. You might get too emotional. You might get too physical. You might get too angry. So it says, be careful. Don't hate your brother in your heart. Verse 18, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. God says, you're not allowed to take revenge into your own hands. So the whole point of this law was to take vengeance out of your hands and put it into someone else's hands, where there's judges and there's witnesses and there's an impartial third party. So I say all that to show you God's law is consistent. God's law is good. God's law is never wrong. Jesus is not overthrowing God's law. Right? And in a lot of ways, our society would get a lot better if God's law was what guided 
our lawmakers. So we're not saying, and Jesus is not saying it was wrong. Okay? But what Jesus is saying is this. You are not to take revenge yourself. Someone wrongs you. Someone insults you. Someone even hurts you. Right? It's not up to you to take vengeance. As long as everybody's doing their, their job here, remember that uh, God instituted something for vengeance. And that's the sword, the government. Now, um, back in our text, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, don't resist the one who's evil. But if someone slaps you, turn the other cheek, right? Uh, I said at the beginning that one of the reasons that we feel like revenge and taking things into our own hands is because of a selfishness and a self-centeredness that's built into our thinking, right? You can write this down for the second point. It's all about that, okay? I want you this morning to reflect on your sinful motives for revenge. We might have some good motives, right? We want justice to take place, but just know, mixed in with a lot of our good motives, we've got sinful motives for why we want to take revenge. I want you to think about those this morning. Because I do want you to bring this back to your daily life and think, okay, we're thinking about Israel and civil laws and arm breaking and oxen and cows. That's not my life. You know, I, I don't break people's arms. I don't have an ox. I have, you know, never seen this take place. So what about in your life? That's what Jesus is talking about. He is talking about your life. He's saying in your daily life, when people do wrong to you, if your first reaction, your gut reaction is fight back, insult back, hit back, punch back, whatever it is, he says, stop, wait. That's not the response of a disciple. There needs to be some kind of different standard. And now, again, this, the passage is so misinterpreted that it takes some qualifications When it says, don't resist the one who's evil, you might ask the question, is Jesus then saying that as a Christian, I can't be a police officer? Because they're supposed to resist the one who's evil. Does it mean I can't be a judge? Because they punish evil people. Does that mean I can't serve on a jury? Because then I'm declaring some statement about someone's guilt or someone's innocence, right? No, I don't think that's what he's saying. Remember, what is he talking about? Interpersonal relationships. He's talking about your relationships as a disciple, right? Isaiah 1 says that... God's people, in their repentance from their sin, God says, you should learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. So he's not saying, no, get out of the whole judgment game. He's not saying that. He's talking about you and your sister. He's talking about you and your classmate. He's talking about you and your mom. He's talking about the fights that take place in your life. Stop resisting. Stop fighting against someone who's doing you wrong. What are the motives for returning insult for insult? The first one, I think, ultimately is selfishness. I already said that, but that's kind of motive number one. What's the sinful motive? Why why do we want to take revenge? Selfishness. A selfish person um, is going to get angry. A selfless person probably won't get angry. They might just be sad. Because if a person sins against you, I want you to remember, uh, does God see that? Yes, he does. What will God do if he's a just judge? What is he going to do to the people that sin bad against you? He will see justice met out. It's going to be worse for them than it's going to be for you. Right? So instead of feeling mad at people, a selfless person sees the big picture and says, whoa, 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 that person who's insulting me, they might not get it. They don't even realize how bad their sin is before God. They don't even understand the wrath of God that they sit underneath because of their sin. And it changes your heart a little bit in the way that you respond. It makes you a little softer. It makes you a little bit less aggressive. It makes you a little less angry when you are insulted or you, you are hurt or backstabbed or relationally you know, gossiped about or something. Philippians 2, 3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Um, If you were to do that, do nothing from selfish ambition. Take no revenge out of your selfishness. But consider the other person more significant than yourself. This is what Jesus did. When Jesus was insulted, he did not insult back. When he was spit at, he didn't spit back. The way Jesus took the blows of being persecuted and being opposed is a lot different than how we naturally feel. Remember the two, the two Beatitudes that we talked about this with? Blessed are the meek. What does that mean? Someone who is the, the punching bag, right? Someone who takes it and doesn't fight back. And then blessed are the peacemakers. 
Same idea. Right? Hard to be a peacemaker or be someone who's always fighting back. Right? Those two Beatitudes and up should tell us this. The other reason I believe that we fight back is because we don't have a right view of what God is doing in all of this. Okay? Once you write that down, why don't you turn to Romans chapter 12 and see this really clearly displayed by the Apostle Paul here. He says, okay, uh, when it comes to your relationships with the other disciples here, your tendency is to repay evil for evil, right? That's, that's what you feel like doing. But what should a disciple of Christ do? Starting in verse 17, this is Romans 12, 17, Paul says, repay no one evil for evil. Christian or non-Christian, he says, no, it doesn't matter. Don't repay them evil for evil. Some non-Christian does evil to you, don't, pay, don't repay them evil for evil. Some Christian does it, don't repay them evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, which should blow up the myth that's so common with Christians that like, I don't care what anybody else thinks about me, I just care what God thinks about me, right? You should care what God thinks about you first, absolutely, partially true, but you should absolutely care what the Christians in your life think about you too and what you're doing. Because a lot of times you think that you're right and you think that God's giving you a thumbs up and he's not. And the other Christians in your life can help you with that. So he says here, give thought to do what's honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And built into that statement is two qualifications. If possible, so far as it depends on you. So it's not always possible to live peaceably with all. Some of you, maybe your, your parents or siblings, it's like it's impossible to be at peace in your home. Like, they make it impossible. Well, do all that you can, so far as it depends on you, if possible, to live at peace with them. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. When someone gossips about you, when someone says something nasty about you, when you feel like you're mistreated or insulted, don't avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. Do you have any idea how personally God takes it when his people are sinned against? Do you have any idea what God, your heavenly father, thinks when you're insulted? You would tremble if you knew God's wrath truly against the people that sin against you. So he says, leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And to the contrary, this gets into what we're going to talk about next week. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. It's like you doing good to somebody who's so mean and angry at you, you doing good to them, it's like that's even making it worse for them in God's eyes. You, you are showing the difference between your righteousness and their sin. It's just more clear. And then verse 21, very important. He says, do not be overcome by evil. This is, this is hard for you if you feel like you've been really, really wronged. If you feel like people have been really nasty to you, you have a temptation, special right here, to be overcome by that evil. God's word says, no, don't be overcome by it, but overcome evil with good. That's the idea here. And this leads to what we'll talk about next week, for sure, about loving your enemies. That's even harder than not retaliating. Going above and beyond, it's more difficult to reflect on that. And all of us should feel convicted, right? If you feel convicted, like, oh, man, I don't do that perfectly. Yeah, that's, that's right. None of us do this perfectly, but we need to be growing in Christ-likeness to do this. Well, how do we do this? Last thing, point number three, I'd love for you to write this down. I want you to plan to personally lose so Christ will win. Plan on it, expect it. You are going to lose so Christ will win. Don't wait until you're in a situation where you want to take revenge to think about this. Think about it now. Think, I'm going to lose. I'm going to plan on losing. Nobody plans on, I mean, some people tank for the draft next season, but you know, we don't usually plan on losing, right? But you do certainly want to lose if it means Christ will win. If you're insulted, right, slapped on the right cheek, let the other be turned also. Write this verse down. This is so important. First Peter chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. Peter writes about Jesus, reflecting on his life, remembering that you as a Christian will face people who are nasty to you. And here's what Peter says. What credit is it if when you sin, you're beaten for it and you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it and then you endure, it is a gracious thing in the sight of God, right? Like if you're insulted and if, it, if the insults that you have faced are because you've been dumb and you, and you deserve it, 
and then it's, that's, God's not saying, oh, man, you got insulted. I, you know, how terrible. It's like, well, if you earned it, <laughs> if you deserve it, well, then, you know, it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when you don't deserve it, when it comes out of left field, when, when you didn't do anything to bring it upon you. Then God says it's a gracious thing on the side of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. For he committed no sin, neither was any deceit found in his mouth, and when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He continued, when he's hurt, he goes to God. He says, God, please take care of this. He doesn't go in and slap back at the people who hurt him, even the people who hit him and struck him. It's even interesting, the people who do that in the New Testament, when, when Jesus is hit, he doesn't hit back. Occasionally, he does say, you know, this is against the law for you to hit me. Right? So there is a little resistance, but it's not the kind of resistance we're talking about here. It's not retaliation. If you're sued, when you have disputes, why not rather suffer wrong? We talked about that recently um, in the passage about anger and trying to reconcile with people. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 6? Paul says, okay, if you're in a dispute with a Christian, why not you rather suffer wrong? Just take the L. Plan on taking the L, and that's fine. Right? It'd be better for you to do that than to get in a fight and make Christ look bad. If someone makes you carry their pack, right? <laughs> If you get voluntold to do something, right, you, you, we all know what that feels like, right, especially if you're at church, right? You get voluntold occasionally. Hey, guys, we're going to do this. That's the way of saying, is it an ask? Is it a request? Is it a, yeah, it's, you know, it's a little bit of both, right? This was so, this is more than that. I'm not comparing the Roman soldiers making you carry a pack to you signing up to serve at Fall Fest or trot the turkey off. This is very different, okay? But when you feel voluntold, when you feel like somebody's making you serve, great, go, go above and beyond. And in particular, we don't have in mind the church or your friends. We have in mind the people who, you know, you work on a class project and they make you do the work, right? And it has to be you because they're not going to do it. That's the situation to me that feels like they're forcing you to carry the pack. Instead of saying, nope, I don't, why do I have to do all the work? I have to do all the work every time. It's because I'm better than you. No, that's not what you do. You say, great, I'll, I'll do it, right? And I'll do even more. Do you need me to do more? I can take more, right? That would surprise that person, right? Especially if they felt like they were exploiting you. And this is what happened. If a Roman soldier went up to a disciple and said, carry the pack, and he said, I'll keep going. Where do you want to go? I'll take it all the way to wherever you're lodging. What kind of impression would that make on this Roman soldier? Like, whoa, why? Why would you do that for me? Well, you got a pretty good response to that. Well, to this I have been called because Christ suffered for me. And then it leads to evangelism. It leads right to that. Your classmates like, why, why are you willing to do the work? It's not just from your selfish motive to say, well, because I'm doing it because nobody else is going to do it and I'm going to do a better job than them. It's because Jesus served me and I'm totally willing to serve you because I love you and I care about you and I want you to know Jesus as well. That motivation changes the way that we do this. And even the giving to the needy part, right? One clarification on that. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, but God's word also says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10 that the rule in the churches was if someone was not willing to work, he should not eat, right? If there's a person that's not willing to work, well, then biblically they shouldn't eat, right? Which is why you, you shouldn't give to every panhandler who's asking you for money because if they're doing that and not willing to work, which is kind of hard to have that long conversation, like, tell me about your life, tell me about your work, but... Um, you're not required to give to them because they're breaking God's rules. They're not working, and they can work. They can do something that's profitable. That's why, it, you know, I always growing up, I heard it's so different from the person who plays music in the subway and has the hat out for money. Oh, dude, give money to them, whatever. They're, they're earning the work. They're playing music for you. That's different than the person begging who's not working, who oftentimes is using deception and pretending to try to make you feel bad, right? And that's just a, a common problem. But he's not saying, hey, you have to give to them. But he is saying, you know the people in your life that need help? You know some people in your life that need help. You need to be open-hearted. First, uh, First John 3, 17 says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, if you're able to meet the need of your brother or your sister or your friend, your coworker, you're like, you can do it. 
and you close your heart against him, how does God's love abide in you? Right? How can you say, oh, I love God and God's love is in me when you can help and you don't and your heart closes? Be careful about that. Yeah. There's some examples of people who've done this really well. One in particular I read about this week was a guy named Billy Bray. Billy Bray was a boxer in the UK in the 1800s. So you could imagine he lost a tooth or two. <laughs> a lot of brawls, a lot of drunken pub fights that this guy got into. He got saved, became an evangelist. Um, I read this in a, in a book that Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote. If you don't know Martin Lloyd-Jones, he's a great person to, to even write his name down and study what he's written about God's word. He was a great preacher in, in London in like from the 60s or from the 40s all the way to like the 80s, I think. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a lot of things. And here's what he wrote about this guy named Billy Bray. He says, Billy Bray was converted, but one day down in the mine, which is where he worked, in a mine, a coal mine, another man who used to live in mortal dread and terror of Billy Bray before Bray's conversion, knowing that he was converted, thought that at last he had found his opportunity. Without any provocation at all, he struck Billy Bray, who could have easily revenged himself upon him and laid him down unconscious on the ground. But instead of doing that, Billy Bray looked at him and said, may God forgive you even as I forgive you, and no more. The result was the man endured for several days an agony of mind and spirit which led directly to his own conversion. He knew what Billy Bray could do. He knew what the natural man in Billy Bray wanted to do. But Billy Bray did not do it. And that is how God used him. That's what I mean by saying, take the loss so that Christ can win. Don't take revenge because now that sets you up to be able to do some good work for God. I want to pray that you're able to do that this week. Let's pray right now. God, we are convicted by this text, which just strikes at the heart of our own selfishness. We know that we struggle to not retaliate, and we know that that comes from a self-centered heart that we all possess, but we pray that you would continue to cleanse us, make us more like you. We know that this happens through practice, so I pray that even this week, Everyone who hears my voice will find an opportunity to, instead of taking revenge, to show love instead, and that you would just change us and make us more like you so that you'll get more honor uh, in the end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.